You're ready to go. Thank you. Oh my God. Um, it's so nice to be here. Hello and welcome. Um, just off the bat, I had several technical issues last night and just until now. So um, I will hope for the best, uh, fingers crossed. But if things don't um, don't work out quite as well as they should, believe me, they did at some point. Um, OK, uh, but this is the fun of it, right? Uh, this is Raspberry Pi baby steps in embedded Rust. So like really tiny, dipping your feet into this if you've never touched this thing before. but um, yeah, I don't want to actually like talk too much because I'm going to talk about this a lot. Who am I? Um, a couple of people who saw me yesterday will know that what comes next. Uh, I'm Lisa. I'm a creative technologist based in Berlin. Uh, creative technologist means that I like playing with technology, the fun stuff, and trying to use it for artistic purposes or sometimes also useful things and ideally combining the two. Um, this is a picture of where I took apart like a little bubble toy that I got for cheap. I uh, hooked it up to an Arduino um, and then had like fun with bubbles. It was like very popular with people. Um, I've been around Rust and the Rust community since 2016, 2017, um, where I just like thought it was cool, jumped in headfirst and um, sent a proposal into a Rust conference. So you heard that EuroRust is coming up, the CFP is closed, but maybe next time just like propose something. And if you get accepted, you actually have to learn the language. This is how I learned the language. Um, and uh, last November, I was like very, very happy um, like to be given the chance to organize Rust and Arts, an online conference where I tried to bring these two worlds together, like in an artistic, playful, interactive, fun kind of, um, or, like all of these kinds of possibilities plus Rust, um, because the uh, intersection is there. Um, artists need tools. Uh, there's like more and more artists that can program that want to like express themselves through uh, either programming or just like any sort of technology that they can like get their hands on. So this is like very exciting to me and also to other people. Um, and this was really cool. So this was me, um, but embedded who this. Um, I, I still remember like the first time somebody was talking to me about embedded development years ago and I was like, but Im embedded in, in what? Uh, because like I couldn't really think about like what, what is this concept? Um, then again, if uh, on Rust's uh, web like homepage, um, we see it like as one of the big like areas where Rust really shines. Like you know, it's like oh, embedded. Um, uh, so embedded is about like uh, tiny microcontrollers, like various things. So my my big area of <laughs> let's call it expertise um, is in the Arduino world. So this is kind of like the hobby, the maker space. So like I don't I don't build production things. I don't actually have to program machines that then build things like cars or whatever tiny else um, um, machines build these days, machines to build more machines. Um, but like this is kind of like my, where I come from, where I learned a lot about electronics and like um, this kind of, um, uh, like, yeah, was dealing with in this space. Um, if you've like looked into like maybe Rust and Embedded, you've maybe come across this thing because the new Rust Embedded Guide um, actually recommends the microbit, um, which is like actually an educational board. Uh, so for it's meant like to be cheap and like kind of it's 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 very nicely designed and already has some components on it that you can um, play with. It's meant to to teach people programming, uh, and I'm like really happy that um, the the Rust embedded book kind of like or the embedded community picked this one up to like um, teach people embedded Rust. Um, and actually only like uh, recently discovered it because. The first time I looked into the guide, they were still recommending this one, um, like a more, I guess, hardcore board, like developer board with like, oh, it has all these things and like, uh, and I'm like, oh, I don't even like, I'm a, I'm a visual person so with like, oh, the website with like where, where you can order it is already kind of, I don't really know if I click the right thing here and do I need something else? What do I need? Um, so this was scary and not very beginner friendly in my opinion. Sorry for touching the microphone. Um, this is much, much nicer, so I'm happy they're going this route. Um, but in the end, there's not just like these microcontrollers, like tiny, like single board things, um, but there's also like single board computers, like where the entire computer lives on a single board. You probably heard of the Raspberry Pi. It's very popular, um, even though they're now getting really expensive because like of production issues that probably people are aware of. Um, 
But the cool thing is that, uh, or like not the cool thing, but the thing is if you want to get into embedded, you kind of, you need some sort of hardware um, to play with it. There's emulators, but I think the fun is actually getting this tangible feeling of I'm programming, but I'm programming the hardware. There's something there. Um, and I always go with like, use what you already have because I have the feeling that most people who program had have at one point in their life been given or gifted some form of Arduino or Raspberry Pi, or they kind of like lie around and they accumulate. Um, so maybe if you don't have one, maybe ask a friend. They probably have one um, because even I had one and I've never really done anything um, with it. So the one that I had at home is the Raspberry Pi model, uh, Raspberry Pi 3, model B. Um, it sits up here. I will show it to the camera and the stream in a second. So I thought, okay, I know a little bit about Rust. I have the single board computer that apparently is also able to run Rust and we can like do something with it. Um, so let's do something with it. Um, just like this is my the, the point where I'm starting. I have super little experience in actual bare metal programming, come from like web development and like higher level languages. I'm like, um, if there weren't so much Arduino related resources on YouTube and the entire internet, I probably would not have been able to build anything at this point. So I'm very, very reliant on like things that other people put out there. So thank you people who put stuff out there for me to learn. It's very cool. Um, so like, yeah, little experience, not really sure what I'm doing, but I have a rough idea of how I actually want. Um, and this is the motivating factor. Cause like, once you know that you want to build something and you know, it's kind of within your range of expertise, maybe, um, you can get there. It might be rough, but you can get there. Um, what do I want? Um, so for me, what I, what I really, really want is, um, physical computing, uh, which is also sometimes, um, yeah, globbed together in like a part of like a creative, uh, creative coding. So what we want is reading from and interacting with the physical world. So reading from could be collecting of data through uh, sensors, some kind of like modules. There's like tons of stuff out there. Um, and interacting with the physical world is basically then not like taking information in, but then after we did something with it, we want to influence the world through our code. And this can be lighting up an LED, which is already pretty cool because lots of LEDs make lots of cool um, uh, lights and uh, like various patterns. It can be really beautiful with just um, creating a little bit of light, um, but we can also like actually interact or like, um, yeah, move the world through like motors and like different kinds of motors that I'm also gonna talk about really quickly. Um, and then have an impact and actually have our code um, magically, robotically, um, do things in the world. So this is really, uh, you can probably see that I'm really into this. Um, so this is what I want to do. Um, for this uh, to work, I had to walk through a couple of steps that I actually had to do today, again, for technical reasons and bad preparation reasons. Um, so if you want to do this, you um, can go one of two routes. Um, you can develop on the device. So um, the Raspberry Pi is, is a complete computer. If you, like, if you have no idea, it's a complete computer. Um, you can put an, uh, an operating system on it. Uh, the classic one is Raspbian OS, which is like a version of Debian. Um, you uh, put it on SD card, boot the SD card, and then you have like a little, yeah. It's an operating system just as, like you're used to. Um, you can use the GUI or um, to extend the browser to install Rust, just like you're used to on your laptop or desktop. Um, it's really nice. Uh, I also linked it, like these slides will be online later. I also linked a video tutorial where like someone walks you through all of these steps. Um, um, and then you can just SSH into the Raspberry Pi. So like I'm actually doing the same here. I hope the network um, will not shut down and like I lose connection because that would be bad. Um, but then, then you can actually like um, SSH into the, into the Pi and then like run your Rust, compile your Rust, write your Rust there if you want. Um, the other option um, is also cool because it like also highlights one of Rust's um, kind of like strengths in a way is that you can cross compile so you can actually write all the code on your laptop and then compile it to a target for the Raspberry Pi um, with the Rust up target add. So like um, if you've never, like if the only target that I ever added uh, additionally was the Wasm target. So like actually adding another one for a microcontroller or for like, a, um, like an ARM device was actually also kind of cool to me. I also, 
um, link to an article where someone actually builds like a little like deploy cross compile setup that is also like really nice. So um, lots of fun to be had. Um, for this one, uh, or like for the rest of the presentation, I will actually um, be working on the Pi um, because yesterday when we like this little laptop here had um, kind of like some performance problems with like streaming and then also compiling. So I hope when I do the compilation on the board, where also pre-compiled things, we don't have to work for uh, word, uh, don't have to wait for forever to get results. Cool, lots of talking. Um, next step is getting to know the Pi a little bit, um, especially these little, um, yeah, what could be like a nice word for them, pointy things. Um, <laughs> Uh, these are called GPIOs, General Purpose Input Output Pins. Um, and if you've never like touched anything like this, um, it might look like kind of weird, like what is the purpose of this? Um, but this is actually the coolest part about the Pi, in my opinion, <laughs> um, because through these little pins, we can like we can uh, connect them to our like our circuits, to the sensors, modu uh, modules, uh, motors, whatever we have and read and write from them, general purpose, input, output. Um, so this is what we're, we're focusing on. Um, it's kind of like putting little wires on these pins um, and then connecting them to our circuits. The thing that I didn't know, because it's different in the Arduino world, is that um, there is a different kinds of numberings for these pins. Um, or like these pins have like certain numbers in software that they don't, that don't really match with like how you would go and count the pins if you're if you just look at it and you would be going or like you look at this row and go like, okay like one two three four or maybe you would go like per um, per column uh, it is not like this it has these special kind of names which is why I recommend um, looking up these kinds of like sh sheets on the internet of saying like okay what are these actually called um, because the first time I tried this was like okay um, we'll see this later when we connect these that I was like it's not very intuitive and you kind of need to know what you're doing. Also, which I also later learned, is that special pins have special functionality on the Pi. You see at the bottom here, um, different kind of like product, like serial protocols that you can speak, like I2C and um, UART, I guess, I don't know how to pronounce them, um, that might be interesting to you. Um, we will actually use one that is not explicitly uh, labeled here. Um, the the uh, PWM pin, um, but just be aware that like if if you read some of these words somewhere, it's like it's protocols to like talk to several peripherals if you want. Um, but the this is not important to know right now, but maybe in your future. Um, the other really important thing to like just quickly brush on basic electronics is the power and ground. So when we build a circuit in a second. We always want to like, um, we need to power, like uh, we, we need to get our power from somewhere and we need to like also basically close our circuit, like our circular thing by like connecting it to ground again. So throughout these pins, we have several ground um, uh, pins that basically all do the same thing, like give us access to uh, a shared ground that, um, that we can use to like close our circuit. Um, in my example here, I actually have a breadboard where I like pin this out, but I will go over this again. But basically, you know, red means where the current comes from, and then it like goes into the ground, and then we like attach things basically in between to do things. I hope like no like actual physics teacher watches me explain this because this is probably really horrible. Um, okay. Uh, so we know a little bit about the hardware. We kind of know in the direction where we want to go. Um, where's the rust part in this? Um, because I don't know how to like actually work with like uh, registers and like how these do um, how things work. Like I will also uh, look forward to Tim's talk later who, because I'm pretty sure I will learn a couple more things about some of the concepts here. Um, but luckily, there's people out there who've been busy writing cool libraries that we can use. Um, I've been working with the RP Pal. <laughs> um, I, I think of it as like my Pal in the Raspberry Pi world. Um, great. So the Raspberry Pi peripheral access library. Um, this is a screenshot from, from the Crates.io page, but we can already see that um, we have all our favorite words here again, GPIO, I2C, uh, PWM, which I briefly mentioned, which we're also going to use SPI, UART. So it's like, oh yeah, 
lots of things that we can use. Um, maybe later, we will only do a couple today, but I think this is actually like, um, like for my little research, the library or the crate that was the easiest to use and just worked. So my recommendation for this kind of endeavor. Okay, um, some electrical components that uh, I will use and also quickly talk about when we see them um, is that I have a breadboard. It basically like helps me put together my little circuit, um, some jumper cables, resistors, um, so like cables are just cables, resistors um, help um, uh, not adjust but regulate uh, the current for some of the components. For example, LEDs might not um, or might break if there's too much current in the circuit. So like you might want to um, put a resistor in front of it just to like um, shield your components a little bit. You have buttons or switches for interaction um, and motors or servers or steppers, like different kinds of motors basically to do, uh, to do cool things in our little projects. If these words mean nothing to you right now, I will show them to you, no worries. Okay, um, so step one. So this is all the prep work done. It's like whoo, whoo, time to breathe. Um, and then we start with step one in, in our endeavor of like, okay, somehow interacting with this thing. And I called it Hello Blinky World because the, I learned that in, in the world of hardware, um, the Hello World is making an LED blink. Um, this is kind of like the same thing. And I thought it was really nice. Uh, RP Pal actually has the blinking light example in the README. Um, so I thought, okay, let's just take this code and try to run it and make an LED blink. And I will attempt this actually, let's see. Uh, so this is the wind, ah, actually let's do it differently because I don't think I'm, I ran into several problems and I have to like quickly, um, uh, Let's do it like this. I think I will show you the code that's on my laptop and then uh, run the code on the Pi. Because I don't think I have an editor on the Pi that is not the default one. And I don't want to use that. Yes, trust all the authors. Okay. So this repository is also online on, on GitHub together with the slides. So you can like look at this if you want. Um, I also want to like include more information about like about the pin connection because that's not really good right now. Feel free to ping me if you want to do this and you don't or you get stuck with this, but okay. Um, with that being said, is this big enough? Yeah, I think so. Um, this is basically the, res uh, the example from the RPPEL README. Um, except that I replaced the error type with, or like the dynamic error thingy with um, anyhow result, but they don't have to worry about this. Um, the cool part here is that we just can use some like standard library stuff like thread and um, like time components or like time functionality. Um, and then we get from our PPL just um, GPIO, GPIO. So the base, um, the base type to interact with our GPIO pins. Uh, and then we say here, and this is already kind of like the thing, um, we create a constant with the actual pin that we want to interact with. In this case, it's 23, and this corresponds to GPIO 23 in the diagram or in the thing that I showed you, and not the physical thing. So it's really the, the GPIO um, notation for this. And in the main function, um, we just print some device info from device info, which is nice. Um, but then the, the actual thing happens here. We create a new GPIO pin, um, and then we, as part of the API, we say get this specific uh, pin that we want to talk to, and then we want to convert it into, like basically saying that like, this should be an output, because we have to be explicit about um, do we want to use a certain pin for input or output? The fault is usually input. Um, so if we want to like write to it or like output something, we have to like say, hey, this pin should be an output pin now. And then the example uses a simple loop, loop statement. Um, and we have a, actually a pretty nice function that is called pin toggle. So we have two states um, on, on or off, or let's say high and low, which is usually what is used in the, in the hardware world. So we want to say um, where low is zero or like false, 
um, and high is true, basically. Uh, so whatever it was before, we toggle between these two, and then we sleep for a little bit, and then we do the same thing again, which will result in a blinking LED. Exciting. Uh, okay, I will actually go to this. So this is on the Pi, and I was um, I hoping I'm still here. It's not responding. Yes, okay. So I ran this, and now I will switch to this camera, which is this one. Yeah, does it work? Cool. So I have my setup over here, and I hope this works. So this is the Pi. Whoop. Oh my god. I need a higher resolution camera, I think. Um, so this is the Pi. Um, maybe let's put it like this. Because like this is how you saw it in the diagram. That would be amazing. OK. Thank you, Stefan. Ah, amazing. This, oh my god. It is very blurry. I am sorry. Um, the important part is I tried to stick to the color coding uh, if my cables permitted it. So red is positive, black is. Ooh, a light. Ah. The, <laughs> how, how many people does it take? Um, no. 15. 15. Okay. Um, red is the positive, black is ground. And then for this example, um, the blue cable is actually the LED. And if you follow it, all the way here, Stefan, can you move? Perfect. Um, we see that I'm here on my little breadboard. Just a little explanation for this. Um, here on the sides, we have a blue and a red line that is indicated, which we can use to say, like basically I, I feed the ground into the blue line, which gives me access to ground in the entire line. Um, same goes for the red line for the positive current. So like I can, I can access the entire positivity, like the, the positive current from there. Um, so what I did then is I branched out, so where the blue cable goes, like all the middle parts, so on the sides it goes from top to bottom, and on the sides basically each, they go by row, um, which is something that is also ra like randomly or seldomly explained. Um, so the blue cable goes into this round, which is I think labeled six, but you can't read this here, um, which shares the, um, which it shares with the LED. Uh, and then the other leg of the LED goes into row, uh, row eight, where I put the resistor. So this is what a resistor looks like. And the other leg of the resistor goes into ground. So if we follow the, like the, the circle of the circuit, we go in here, positive. Um, then throughout this row, th through the LED, um, through the resistor and back into ground. What's the use of the blue cable now? This is where we now say from the Pi, write high current into this. Um, because like actually if you've paid attention and I ha didn't say it, that in this circuit we don't actually use the red cable yet. Um, so the positive current in this example actually comes from, uh, the positive current actually comes from the blue cable. Ah, I was talking too fast for my own good. Um, comes from the blue cable, it goes into here. So every time we write like the toggle, we write either high or low, so like give current or not. Um, and then we wait half a second uh, and depending on which state we're in, the LED is blinking and it's blinking. Hooray! Cool. Thank you, Stefan. <laughs> ah. You get a better setup. Amazing. Cool. Um, so with the blinking LED, we have like step one um, resolve. We could like write a little bit of something into, into the world. And um, first of all, make sure that we can actually talk to our GPIO pins. Um, and second of all, be like, uh, yeah, did our first thing in the real world. Amazing. Um, all right, this is the, the diagram again. Um, Here's the connection again. So this is all documented, at least in the slides, if you want to do this again. Um, and we ran it. Cool. Um, step two, hello, touchy world. Uh, so we, we wrote something out into the world, but it's also, I talked about like reading from, from the world. So like kind of interacting, like we need to interact with something. Um, and 
I chose touch because like I have this like touch sensor that I can also show you in a second. Um, and there was another thing that I stumbled upon coming from Arduino because the um, standard Arduino Uno board that you have has digital as well as analog pins. And what's the difference? Um, is that in the physical world, um, binaries actually don't exist. So everything is um, uh, an analog signal or like it, it, it has various, it's, it's a range of things. So when we say um, it's either like we write to the, um, to the LED and we either say high or low, what we mean is we, we go to the extremes of the ends um, of this current to make sure that we get a clearly discernible state. Um, but in reality, we can like, um, we could adjust this and we sometimes see this because you can dim light based on the current that you send through um, a thing. Um, and the thing is that, um, um, the, so the Arduino owner can read analog, uh, um, uh, analog signals, analog inputs. So like we, we can actually like um, get all this like finer grained information. Um, but the standard Raspberry Pi can actually not. It has only digital pins. And I didn't know this beforehand. I was like, okay, this kind of is annoying because a lot of the easy to use sensors that I wanted to use actually rely on, on analog um, signals and inputs. Um, so I was kind of like, okay, maybe I do use like a simple button, but then I realized that other, um, that this touch module that I have is basically what it does is, um, even though it's an, it's an analog um, module, let's say, that if you touch it, um, you basically close the current, and if you don't touch it, um, like, uh, uh, if you touch it, yeah, you close the circuit, I mean, and if you don't touch it, um, the, the circuit is kind of uh, interrupted. And even though it's, an, it's, an, it's supposed to be an analog um, module, I still get the two states. So I could kind of like hack around this by saying, okay, this is enough for me to, um, to actually work with this. Um, and I actually also have to keep an eye on time anyway. Uh, okay, so uh, to go the next step, um, uh, reading from a touch sensor, uh, I connected the, the, the ground and the voltage as we had before. A touch sensor has three pins. Um, so we go into, um, voltage and ground, and then we have the signal that we can, so that we can read from it. Um, I put it into GPIO uh, 24, so like next to the LED, so I can, for this example, use everything. Um, I will whip, quickly look at the code for this one, because, um, yeah. And it's um, uh, similar in a way, um, as opposed to like the, the LED, so we still get the GPIO pin, um, I called into input, which I think is optional in this case, um, but just to be explicit that like this is an input. Um, and then I wrote another loop where basically I want to say, or like read um, from this pin, if it is high, um, so if, if someone, if it's getting touched, um, I want to print high, and if it's not getting touched, like there's no, no connection, it should print low. Um, and then we sleep for a little bit in between so that we don't like spam our, like we're gonna spam our terminal anyway, um, but not so much. Okay, so let's run touch. It should, it prints low. Okay, so this, this is working. Um, and I don't know if you can switch the camera over uh, to this camera. Yeah? Yeah? It's going, okay. Um, so this is the um, touch module. It's really just like a little square. to see if I made a stupid mistake. No, but this should all be okay. <laughs> okay, uh, maybe let's not use too much time on it. It was then part of my technical mishap. 
um, from earlier. Believe me that it does, or like it did actually work at some point. Um, but like, I want to uh, uh, get moving to like, not take too much time and like also get to the big finale. Um, Cause there's step three uh, as well. Cause like um, reading to like uh, sending stuff out into the world, like an LED is cool. Um, but I think it's super actually like super duper interesting if we actually start playing with motors cause they have so much potential and you can build a lot of stuff with them. Um, and for this example, I actually brought a, a server with me, which us, I'll show you in a second. It's, it's a tiny motor that is actually like quite sophisticated in a way because um, we uh, can control exactly um, in which position it, it should move um, with just code. And this part of like method of, of telling the servo what to, how to do that is called PWM or pulse width modulation. Um, and what we're actually doing is that like in certain intervals, um, which are indicated like always when, like when we start sending a pulse. Um, so this like in, in, in certain intervals, we send a signal for a certain length. And based on the length of the signal, the server then understands in which, which position um, it should move to. Uh, if this is a little abstract, it will hopefully be clearer in a second. Um, just like for these tiny cheap like hobby servos that you get um the the range is usually that it can move like from zero to like a um 180 degree angle so like kind of like a half circle um there are also like now servos that can do a full like 360 so if you want something specifically like this um look out for it in the shop uh, but like usually this is like the 180 degree angle is what you what you usually get if you get like the the standard average um, servo. They usually also come in packs of five, like they're really affordable. Um, okay, the circuit for the server is a little bit more, uh, or like only actually like a tiny bit more um, elaborate, um, let's say. Um, for some reason, the, the cable the servo comes with, um, the VCC is also indicated in red, ground is brown and not black for some reason, but now you know. Um, and then another note that I wrote really is like tinyly in here is that um, uh, usually if you have a motor and like they can also be like really, really big and powerful, you should separate the power supply from your motor from like the rest of the circuit and like the, um, uh, yeah, of the components that you work with because when the motor starts working, it draws a lot of current which can kind of like uh, lead to like really like gaps or like uh, disrupt like the rest of the circuit and you kind of like want the stability so you should separate this. Um, but this little example here, it's fine, but if you want to like do something with like a big motor that pulls something, you probably want like an external, like a different, uh, different supply for that. Um, yeah, and then we connect the pulse, which is the third, um, the third uh, pin on the servo uh, to the, um, uh, to the recipe. Um, there's another thing that I didn't know, and it gets you. Our people gives you an error that I didn't really, couldn't really connect from what was happening to what the issue was. Um, is that the Raspberry Pi provides hardware accelerated pulse width uh, modulation, which is really like accurate and fast and cool, but you have to enable it first. Um, but there's actually a section in the RP pal um, documentation that tells you how to do that. So that's if you get like a I think it's I think it's just permission denied, and I was like, what kind of permission? Um, this is, might be related to this. Okay, uh, quick, let's run through the code so that we can get to the finale. Um, the biggest difference is that in uh, that um, instead of GPIO, we now get uh, PWM, and then we get channel polarity and PWM from that, and these constants are important um, because they depend on the kind of servo that you have. So these are the, um, um, the units for the standard, like the little blue servo that you see in a second, um, where the, the period in milliseconds, like this, this value is kind of like the, the frequency in which we send the pulse. Um, and then 
yeah, we can kind of deal with that neutral position, but like this is basically the the length of the the, the pulse signals um, that we then set, like they give us the position of the servo. So the minimum pulse length is 500. It's not milli, it might be microseconds here, actually. I'm not sure. Um, and then to, this would be zero angle. Um, and then the max is um, 2,500 microseconds um, to get to the um, 180 degree position. Okay, now that we know that, we can go to main and uh, initiate our PWM with period where we put in all this information um, I, from microseconds and then the, the, the period is in milliseconds. Um, what polarity means in this case, I am not sure, um, but I just put it in from the example so it works. Um, so what happens is that we initialize this, we sleep for half a second, and then I say, hey, um, send a different pulse, so like set pulse width, and then um, we move to the minimum, so like the zero angle, then we sleep again, and then we do this little loop uh, that basically says, oh, then walk to, like for minimum, walk to the neutral position um, in like small steps, so it looks like it's a little rotating. And I will actually not start this right now. Can we also get the camera on the setup again? Of course. Cool. Um, so this is a little servo. Um, they're usually like very small. And they also come with different kinds of um, these little things to put on top, different kinds of arrows. So I use this one because it like clearly indicates like where we're going here. Okay. Yep. Could we put a screen ah. yard on your computer because then everybody in the audience here in Minsk can have a You don't see it. No. Oh, gosh. Well, let's do it like. Just to take the screen, yes. Awesome. Okay. And then anything, just show again the okay. Let's do it like this. Okay, this is the servo. Cool, it's very small. Um, there's all, all the logic and all the electronics are actually inside this little thingy. Um, you see the cables coming out. Uh, I placed the important cable that sends the pulse in. Whoa, now it detached it. Damn it, not good. Put it on here. Um, and then uh, I will try to run the code and like hold this and you can see what's happening. So remember that we'll like walk through the positions uh, automatically. Uh, da -da -da -da. Oh my God, I will never do this again, this is too much. Did you see it? Should I do it again? Yes. Yeah, okay. So we start with the Mac. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and so we started with Mac position, then switched to, to minimum, and then like we iterated over the top. We have everything now. So the, the only thing that's missing really is a creative idea with like what to do with this stuff. And I'm probably way over time. I'm very sorry. Um, but uh, I don't know if I have a slide for this section. Let's see. Bring everything together. Okay, let's do this. So I need to do a little bit of rearrangement because I only have one Raspberry Pi with me. So I will quickly unplug all of these and then build up this, this piece here. Can you switch to Yes, I am sorry. This. Uh, da -da -da -da. So. Uh, this is here. Oh my God. Uh, 
we can do questions while I do this, but only easy questions so they don't have to think too hard. <laughs> How many pulses do you need to send for the mode to, do it, to a specific position? Is one enough or is it? One is enough um, to move, but it will, um, like, it kind of requires, like, the, the frequency, you have to keep up the frequency anyway, right? As so, like, we can, we, we change the pulse once, but the pulse is actually constant. So it's not actually true what I said first. We need the constant pulse, um, but then we keep it at the same value to, for that. Uh, one, two, three, one, two, three, here. Uh, da, 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 and this should be uh, here. And this is one, two, three here. Oh my God. Um, Where does this one go? Right here. I believe this one goes here. Uh, Stefan, is there my notebook there? No. Ah, it is in the front, actually. Perfect. Where I put my little cheat note in case I forget everything. Uh, this is the servo. Can I follow the mic? Yes. Then I can dig to a few minutes. Thank you. While Lisa is preparing the rest of her demo, uh, I have a, um, a surprise for you. Uh, I hope you will like it. Uh, I asked the Grand Garage people to do something for us because we're here in a makerspace and so we have something for you. And I will try to show it to you here. Can you see it? Can you see it? Can you see it? Can you see it? So you will get your very own special laser cutted Rust logo with the lint thing and so on. So uh, I hope it will it will come out of the laser cutter in time. Uh, I have one and we get 20 of them. So everybody who is here should get one. I'm, I hope it will be done uh, in a second. Cool. Uh, I'm also almost done. Um, I only slightly confused myself with one, two. Then touch. Okay, this should work. Uh, hopefully, and then let's get. <laughs> Worked yesterday. <laughs> okay, let's go with this. I'll hold this like this. So, uh, maybe we can even do it. Very professional of me. Okay. Um, so I built a little game um, with this. It's a complete hardware game. Um, and I built a beautiful interface out of cardboard um, and a little bit of gaffer tape. It travels very lightly. It's nice. Um, so the idea is that you're kind of like trying to, to crack um, into a vault or something. And you have to like guess um, three random numbers uh, in sequence. And if you indicate it as indicated by the three blue lights at the top, um, the servo arm will kind of uh, move from zero to 180. And um, in the background, every time it is close to the randomly generated number um, that we don't know, the yellow LED will give us an indication of like, oh, we're close. And then if we're close, we need to tap the touch sensor. And if we're fast enough, 
we basically crack the code and then once we have all three numbers we get the light show um my only worry is that the touch sensor might not play well with us right now but let's see how it goes um uh, uh, let's play it hopefully oh, damn it. i called it panzerknacker and I couldn't write it. Okay. Wrong window. Okay. So what happened in the beginning, if the, you maybe heard it, is that it did a little configuration. Um, and I also did uh, the LEDs are in the wrong order, but this is fine. And you can see, <laughs> um, you can see the servo just like ticking through the individual steps, like one by one. And once we get close to the secretly generated number in the uh, in the code, we ah no no it didn't. This might not be the case that I just don't get the correct touch signal, or I was just too slow, or there's a bug in the code anyway. Uh, let's see. Okay. Something happened that wasn't supposed to happen, but this is the idea of the light show in the end. Um, this is like a quick example of just like throw everything together. Um, you can play it later. Uh, maybe when it's not live, it will work magically, uh, much more reliably. Um, but just to give you an idea of the code, um, how does this work? Basically, I threw it all together, uh, made a little game state struct to keep um, the data in place. Um, da, 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 da. We have like yeah, also like a little state. So we have like this little setup configuration, then the actual play loop, and then the win, and the place with the um, just links all the LEDs. We have a lot of setup code. Um, then we have a little bit uh, random number generation, um, setting everything up, and then actually the the loop that I'm using with is just like matching on the states. So instead that we set everything to low and sleep and then do a little oh. servo movement just to see if everything works. Um, and then in play, um, I'm actually like uh, matching on like the, the current LED is kind of like indicating which, which state are we in right now. So like if all LEDs are like blinking, or like they're all like high, um, this is kind of like the indication that we actually won. Um, this is the, the matching on the current number that just like use a little bit of wiggle room with like the actual number because like we can't actually be that precise with the with the movement. Um, but basically once you, you match the number, we generate a new one and in like start blinking another part of like the next LED. Uh, and this is like a little bit of logic to make the server move in one direction until it hits maximum and then like move it in the, in the other direction. Um, and then the code for the light show, and this is it. It's not that much. Um, it's also not that pretty, maybe, but it like gets you um, there to make a little hardware game, um, and that's fun. You can make it like in a little box and just put a cable in there, and then people can play it. Um, this is it. Oh, I'm so I'm so excited. Um, uh, so this was baby steps, like just like mostly dealing with electronics and minimal part on the Rust embedded side. Um, but I think it's a super nice way to like just ease into because like, we can write code um, as we're used to in like a not embedded environment and just like go from there. I put up a couple of um, videos, uh, especially the one by uh, Marco Aman, who's like, <laughs> I think it was also like a Russ Lin session maybe, um, uh, where he goes from like zero to um, no standards, like actually going a fully bare metal. Um, so like if this is more like the, the way you want to go, um, check out this video. And then I can only say, vielen Dank, and then I finally stop talking. <laughs> and um, thank you very much.